All right, folks, I think I'm gonna start up here. All right, uh, so I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, Water Institute Water Talk here at the University of Waterloo. Uh, it is very much my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. David Stewart of North Dakota State University. Uh, Dr. Stewart is the Walter B. Booth Distinguished Professor at NDSU. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and he is a recent chair of the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at that university. Uh, Dr. Stewart did his PhD at the University of Minnesota, uh, working with the founder of the analytic element method, Dr. Otto Strock. Uh, he has spent uh, much of his career at Kansas State University, where he's been working in interdisciplinary studies of water resources, uh, but also spending a good deal of time and publishing extensively on the analytic element method, uh, both developing mathematical improvements to the method and applying it to new fields to which it hadn't been applied to before. Um, this work has kind of culminated to a recent publication of a, of a book on the analytic element method, which I think he's going to be addressing a bit in his talk, um, and we're, which we're looking forward to here. So uh, Julie, could you go to the next slide? Uh, before we proceed, I just want to acknowledge that uh, the University of Waterloo, who's hosting this talk, is located on the Haldeman Tract, uh, which is land promised to the Six Nations in the Treaty of, eight, of 1784. Uh, that tract extends six miles on either side of the Grand River. Uh, at this point, I'd like to pass it over to you, uh, Dr. Stewart, and I will say I'm very much looking forward to your talk today. Very good. I should have the screen share. I will uh, note one more thing that this uh, talk will be recorded. Very good. Th thank you, uh, Dr. Craig. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to visit with you today and, and share some of the new things that are going on in the analytic element method. Um, the, um, I, I know that we're going to be, uh, we have some, some applied mathematicians in the audience and, and the methods that we use for the analytic element method I'll kind of highlight about halfway through the talk. Uh, they're fairly simple mathematical solutions, but they've been brought together in, in new ways that allow us to be able to achieve the solutions that we, we have not previously been able to, to, uh, to achieve. As, uh, as Dr. Craig said, uh, there's a number of new fields that the analytic element method has been applied to and also highlight a lot of those advances as well. Uh, before I get started, I'd, I'd like to um, uh, just kind of show you the, the, the book here, The Analytic Element Method, Complex Interactions of Boundaries and Interfaces. This is a book that I published about a year ago. Uh, with Oxford University Press. And it brings together uh, the methods that I've been using with, with my colleagues uh, over the last few decades and, and kind of puts it together in a way that, that is, is uh, easy, I hope, for people to pick up. And uh, before I go through and show you some of the examples, I'm just gonna jump out of here. If you're on a computer and if you wanna open up your computer to a web browser, I'm gonna jump out here for just a second. And um, I'm going to just, I'll use Google and I'm just gonna put in AEM, Analytic Element Method and my last name, Stuart. If you are not at a web browser, you can go back and do this again um, at any of your computers. Uh, the first thing that pops up on my computer here is Analytic Element Method, uh, globaloup.com. And if I click on that link, uh, that's the link to the book. And the reason I wanted to show you this uh, is, is not so much for the book right now, but for the companion site. So there's a companion website available. When I uh, worked through the contract with Oxford, I, I wanted uh, quite a bit of the book to be available for free so that could, people could kind of get a flavor of what the analytic element method is so it could be broadly distributed and people could kind of see, is this something that I would want to use in, in, in the studies that I'm, I'm, I'm working on? Is it something that I would, that I would want to use? And so Right here, uh, the supplementary material contains the first chapter in section 2.1. I'm gonna take you through that a little bit later. Uh, so you don't have to worry about going through it right now, but it, I'll, I'll take you through that in a little bit. And it also has supplementary material right here. It's a zip file. Um, the second version of it is out there right now. I'll be updating it again fairly soon with uh, some more material, but approximately uh, the first half or almost two thirds of the book, the figures that are in the book have been implemented and I'll show you how to use the software to be able to, to uh, learn the methods along with um, the presentation of the book. 
Um, I'm going to go back now, and if if you are at this site, uh, please don't spend the next half hour going or 20 minutes going through the material. Instead, if you could uh, come back and stay with me for just a little bit, what I'm going to do is I'll um, take you through and uh, show you. Um, here we go. I'm going to show you some examples of the analytic element method and what kind of things we can do with the analytic element method. Um, it started in the groundwater world. And so a lot of these examples have, have bearing to groundwater. Um, I'll show you some examples for wells. So I'll just kind of use my pointer here to take you around the circle. Uh, wells, uh, groundwater surface water interactions, phreatophytes. So these are plants that can pull water up from the ground, uh, cracks and fissures, heterogeneities, and uh, vatozone uh, flow. So flow recharge down through the vatozone and then uh, waves. So I was a coastal engineer for a year at, at the University of Maine as a postdoc and picked that up there. And um, uh, I, I also wanted to uh, kind of shout out that uh, you have one of the lead analytic element method people working in your institute as well at Waterloo. Uh, James Craig has written a number of excellent articles and he's um, he wrote a computer code uh, visual AEM uh, which I use to teach my classes, and I know is being used to teach groundwater classes really throughout the world. So uh, shout out to James and uh, the methods that he's promoting through the education uh, of visual AM at, at University of Waterloo. Um, so how does the analytical element method work, or, or how do we use it to model things? Well, let's start with a well. Um, if we look at a well from up above, if we look from straight down, it looks like a point on a map. Um, when, we, when we are trying to model what's going on around a well, we specify boundary conditions. So this is kind of like the way we visualize the world with analytic elements. We, we look at things in terms of their geometry, how they interact with the world, and what kind of mathematical functions we need to be able to interact with the world. So it looks like a point. Uh, we typically will specify pumping rates, so how much water is being pulled out of an aquifer. And we have some, some fairly standard mathematical functions that we use to be able to model those. Uh, the team solution for steady well and high solution for, for well drawdown. Uh, the team solution gives you something that looks like this. These lines are given uh, groundwater head or groundwater elevation. The arrows point in the direction of groundwater flow. Uh, so this is the steady flow of water. Been, if it's been turned on for a long time, that's the team solution. The Tice solution starts with an initial flat plane and looks at the cone of depression as it progresses over time. The kind of things that we can do with these in, in, in the analytic element method, and I'll show you this example. This is the first one I'll show you uh, of, the, of the example code. We have three wells and uh, they have pumping rates. There's a regional gradient that's trying to drive the flow past the wells. These uh, black lines are lines of constant groundwater elevation. The flow goes in the direction of the arrows. The white lines are the streamlines, the, the, so they're the trajectories of the groundwater particles. And we can see by looking at the streamlines that some of the groundwater particles end at, at this well, some end at this well, some flow between the wells. So, so these solutions that we have with the analytic element method for, for wells, they allow us to be able to look at things like capture zones and where do we need to protect water where do we need to protect land use to be able to make sure we have clean drinking water? So that's an analytic element method solution for a well. Uh, next on the list is groundwater surface water interaction. And when we look at uh, groundwater from up above, uh, it looks like a line. Um, we have different kinds of boundary conditions. Sometimes we'll specify the elevation of the river. Sometimes we'll specify that the bed has a certain resistance and so it's holding that water up away from the aquifer. Uh, we have different ways of being able to model this. Um, wells and, and uh, line sinks are all in visual AEM. So if you want to play with some code, uh, that's, that's uh, really has a nice interface, visual AEM is there. Um, this is an uh, example of a couple of different kinds of, of lines that we can use. These are curved lines. So this is a Bezier curve and a beast line. These are the curves that are used in uh, ArcGIS and in mod and, uh, PowerPoint. And um, this is just an example of a small piece of a, of a river that's separated from the groundwater. So the head is not constant along the river, but instead uh, there's, a re there's a resisting layer in the bottom that's holding that water up. Um, the kind of things that we can look at with these, with these uh, this is an example of a river network. Uh, so there's a, a river network. This comes from a paper that we published in Water Resources Research a few years ago. And uh, this is, so this is a river network. 
Um, what we did is artificially, we, we allowed the head to increase by an increment of one along every stream reach, not that that's physically what's going on, but just to be able to visualize how accurate the model is. Uh, this area here is blown up by a factor of 100. So it's, uh, and, and then this area here is blown up by a factor of 100. And um, you can see that, that these, these lines of constant elevation, um, they're specified to be linear along each line. And we match the specified boundary conditions very accurately. In fact, with this solution, uh, we match the groundwater elevation at each one of the control points that we specify along these lines uh, to six to, six to eight significant digits. That's that's fairly typical. So we have a, an extremely accurate solution of a river network. We could have blown up into any one of these sections of the river and we would have gotten the exact same level of detail. So it's an extremely accurate solution. Um, if you if you have seen analytic element method before, you'll be this is very familiar to. You. If you have not seen analytic element method, uh, it's just a, an extremely accurate method to be able to to analyze uh, groundwater flow patterns. Um, the mathematics behind it are single layers, and I won't go through that right now. Just you know, that's that's the kind of mathematical functions they are. So here's our example of uh, stream network. Uh, next, phreatophytes. And so for adophytes, when you look at it from up above, um, it looks like, uh, in this case, a circle. We're just drawing a circle around the canopy of the, of the tree or the root area. Uh, we have a specified extraction. So this kind of looks like a well. It's taking the water out along the top of an aquifer and from a ways away, it looks like a well. Uh, we can have fields of phreatophytes that uh, withdraw water. And so uh, they, they pull up water collectively as a field. And uh, the solutions here, there are solutions to the Poisson equation. Um, this is an example of a capture zone. So this is the kind of thing you can do with analytic elements. This is a capture zone. Instead of the capture zone for a, a well that I showed you just a moment ago, this is a capture zone for an individual tree. And so this is a, a view from looking above. So this is the canopy of the tree or the root area of the tree. Uh, groundwater is trying to be, is the regional gradient of groundwater is trying to drive the flow past the well. If we kind of draw a line straight through there and look at a section view, um, in this particular part of Kansas, we know that the, from, from doing isotope analysis that the amount of water being brought up in the tree uh, averages out to about eight times more than the regional recharge that's occurring in the area. And so there's eight times more extraction than there is recharge. And so when we look at, at groundwater particles beneath the tree, they're trying to be driven past the tree, but they're being drawn up uh, by, the, by the roots. Uh, further away from the tree, uh, we have water particles with, with the recharge occurring on top of those. And if we trace particles around this tree backwards in time, we get kind of a three-dimensional visualization of a capture zone for a phreatophyte, a capture zone for a tree. And um, uh, this particular figure here, if we look at the capture zones for a set of trees, um, uh, I, uh, Trevor Ehring worked on this with me and we depicted uh, a couple thousand uh, cottonwood trees and looked at the individual capture zones. And once again, kind of like this individual tree, the, the capture zone, the, the wells as you, or the path lines, as you go backwards in time, they go down beneath the trees and then they come back up when there's no trees there. So we get these funny path lines, if you trace them forward, they'll end up at, at these individual trees. Uh, in complicated geometries of capture zones uh, for, for trees. And so there's an analytic element method solution for trees. Uh, next is heterogeneities. And so heterogeneities can look like a line or it can look like an area, like a polygon. Uh, we have a variety of different kinds of boundary conditions we can apply to these, uh, different kinds of mathematical functions that we can apply. Uh, this particular example is flow that looks like a, a fracture where water is coming into one end, flowing along the fracture and flowing back out uh, into the aquifer on the other end of the, of the fracture. Here's a set of linked fractures. Uh, here is a heterogeneity. This is kind of like a sand with a coarse sand or a gravel inclusion, and it draws the water 
and the water moves more quickly through. You can see the arrows that are larger. It moves more through through the heterogeneity. Um, we can also have, and I'm going to come back to this example of of a gravel inside of a fine sand or a sand just a little bit later on in Nevada zone also. Um, we can also have different boundary conditions. This is a boundary condition that tries to make the water flow around the element. So you could think of this as being like a sheet pile uh, where the water is flowing around it. Uh, here's a set of 500 uh, elements that are impermeable and the water is trying to flow around and, and um, all these elements. Um, this there's like I said there's 500 elements here. This is you could view this as a set of clay lenses of kind of semi arbitrary orientation that are interacting very closely with one another to make the water flow in or flow through the various uh, passages between the elements. Um, th this is an analytic element method solution that we published uh, a slit element in water resources research a, a few years ago and and I don't think there's any other uh, numerical methods, at least none to my knowledge, that can match the kind of detailed depictions that you get of the infinite flows at the ends, the infinite velocities, and the close interactions of these elements. Um, so that's heterogeneities. Uh, next is the vatosone. And so in the vatosone, recharge tries to go down until it hits groundwater. Uh, these, uh, this depicts a set of uh, heterogeneities that kind of look like circles. So we've got we can have gravel or we can have uh, silts inside of a, a fine sand. And uh, this depicts uh, a silt in homogeneity inside of a fine sand. Uh, it has a set of boundary conditions, um, pressure head, which is these darker lines. This, this is pressure head. is continuous across every one of these interfaces. Um, also, all the flow that goes into the interface has to come into the element. So it matches a continuity of flow and a conservation of mass. Um, uh, and a con uh, I'm sorry, conservation of mass and a, a conservation of energy uh, boundary conditions. And um, this particular uh, element is located down here close to the water surface. This is groundwater. Uh, and this is located further up in the Vado zone. So we know in, in the Vado zone that the pressure head becomes negative as you go up in the water or in the, in the soil column. And this, is, this is element is further up in the in the soil column above the water table. Um, this is a coarse sand inside of a fine sand. And so this is like the heterogeneity that I showed you in groundwater just a little bit ago. Um, and and I, I, uh, just kind of as a heads up here, I'm gonna take um, a couple minutes to take any questions you have in, in about three more slides. So if you've got questions about any of these particular examples, I'll, I'll take some questions. And then after a few questions, then I'm going to go on and show you how these methods actually work, how, how we can implement them. Um, so, so this is a kind of like a coarse sand inside of a fine sand. This is down here at the water table. And if I go back again, a couple of slides, just to show you, in groundwater, gravel draws water. In the Vado zone, if you're down close to the water table, gravel draws the water as well flow flows flow the front flow th flows through the heterogeneity. Well, that's a tongue twister uh, more readily uh, in the gravel than it does out in the sand. But as you get further up in the water column, the gravel actually repels the water. The water flows around it because it's because of the saturated conductivity relationship. It's a nonlinear relationship. And as you get a drier uh, uh, or a, a negative, a lower negative pressure, uh, the gravel dries up more quickly than uh, than a fine sand does. So it's just a, an interesting artifact that you learn from these kind of analytic solutions, um, the way that the the recharge is is behaving in nature. Um, the last example that I'll show you comes from coastal engineering, and. Uh, we have different types of geometries we can look at there. Uh, these are a little bit more complicated because the boundary conditions are actually complex. There's a real and an imaginary part. Uh, we have Hilbert conditions that, that incorporate those. Uh, there are also solutions to the Helmholtz equation. So the mathematics, again, is, is a little bit different mathematical equation. Um, the solutions, uh, th this is uh, an impermeable object. So you could think of it as as an island that the waves, long waves are moving past. 
or you could think of it as as a bridge pier uh, that the waves are, are moving uh, moving past. This just shows the interaction of a lot of different impermeable uh, objects uh, or refle fully reflecting objects, I guess I should say. And um, this, this top set of panels here shows the amplitude. So if we have waves and if we look at the, the height of a wave above the mean sea level, that's the amplitude. So this gives us a depiction of the height of waves. It, this, this particular example has partially standing waves because some areas the waves are bigger and some areas the waves are smaller uh, than they would be out in the, in the open sea. We also visualize those using the phase. Uh, the phase is white at the top of a wave and dark at the bottom of a wave, white at the top of a wave. So we can see the top of the wave, the bottom, the trough, the crest of the waves. And so the phase and the amplitude together allow us to get a depiction of how waves are moving through a field. In order to match the boundary conditions, these lines uh, of constant amplitude and lines of constant phase should intersect the boundary at 90 degrees, and they do. Uh, so once again, we have a very accurate depiction. Um, the, uh, this, this was published in, in uh, ASE Journal of Ports um, in 2018, and uh, this is the first analytic element method solution of, uh, of coastal engineering. Um, we extended that with the paper, or I guess I should say I did. I think I was the only author on that one. Uh, we extended it in 2020 to waves moving uh, through objects. And so this is waves uh, moving across uh, shoals, across an area that has a, a shallower water depth. In shallower water, the waves get closer together and their amplitude increases. And this is waves moving across troughs. So depressions in, in the bottom of the ocean. And uh, once again, these lines should be intersecting or they should be continuous across the interfaces and lines of constant phase should be continuous as well. So we have an, an extremely accurate solution uh, of uh, analytic element method. Um, this particular type of a model is used to look at not only depressions and shoals or uh, depressions in, in shoals, but also to look at um, vegetative matter. There's been a number of papers published in the last five years or so that have looked at waves as they move through vegetation and coastal regions and, and how the wavelengths are changed within those. Um, this is the first paper that publishes uh, solutions with more than one vegetative patch uh, using the analytic element method. So the other methods, that it's, it extends the existing methodology that we have today. And um, this is just a, a depiction of a tsunami length wave. So something a period about five minutes moving across the deep water shoals and the amplification on the backside of the set of shoals and tsunami waves. So I'm gonna take just a real quick uh, break here. Um, J James, are there any questions out there that the people have at this particular moment? There are no questions in the Q&A right now, Dave. Okay. Very good. Then I will go ahead and um, kind of go through the. So so I'm I'm going to I'm going to take a kind of a quick step back here. Um, analytic element method allows us to be able to develop very accurate solutions of a very wide range of problems that are of interest to us in the water world. Um, these these examples also have uh, counterparts in other fields. And um, I'm going to show you that in just a second. So here I will get out of the presentation here. And I'm going to go to, this is a copy of the um, PDF that's available for you at the web page. Uh, this is the full book, so it has a little bit more than the version that's out there, but you will have basically pages one through pages 79, I think. Um, in the analytic element method, um, there, there's a number of, of fields of study that analytic element method has been explained to. So we take the mathematics that exist, uh, basically the mathematics that were developed up through like about the 1960s or so uh, for all these different fields. Um, and, and I can give you an example that, that that water, uh, the waves, let me 
me actually go back here. The waves moving uh, or reflecting off of one L, uh, island that was published by uh, HOMA in the Shore Protection Manual back in the 1950s. And, and we have very similar, uh, Sommerfeld published uh, similar types of solutions for electromagnetic waves. So the, these theories and the, the foundation of the analytic element method, the actual mathematics were put together by by mathematicians and engineers up through about the 1960s or so. And they were able to look at something like this where you have waves reflecting off of one island, uh, but they were not able to, to go forward and, and figure out how, those, how these elements interact with one another and how the waves reflecting off of one island interact with the waves reflecting off of other islands or how the waves uh, moving across one shoal impacted down the lee side shoals or the 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 the, the up the uh, the the ones that are closer to the open sea and so they they were not able to do that because they didn't have the computational uh, capacity to be able to solve those equations and and that led to um, us developing a set of techniques that would would solve those when we got computers finite elements and finite differences and that's really where most of the field has gone is in, in those is is in the finite uh, um, element and finite uh, differences methods, um, but but just as the computer has allowed us to be able to take those finite techniques and implement them in new ways, the computers have also allowed us to be able to take the groundwater or, uh, type solutions that we had the exact same things the, the analytic solutions and apply them in brand new ways to look at things like these river networks. And, um, and so there, there's, there's, there's a lot of powerful mathematics that were developed through the 1960s or so that, that we kind of forgot about. And, and there's been kind of a renewed interest in people to come back and, and revisit some of those methods. And the analytic element method gives you a really powerful way to be able to bring those together. Um, so, so there, the, the, each one of these examples here, groundwater flow, let me blow this up for you. Groundwater flow, Vado zone flow, incompressible flow. So this is things like flow over airplane wings, uh, thermal conduction. So this is heat flow, electrostatics, looking at voltage and, um, and currents, uh, water waves and acoustics, elasticity, looking at stress strain relationships. The governing equations from these different fields are all pulled together in ways that the analytic element method can utilize. And then a set of examples for, for those different fields are shown. Where I'm gonna take you right now is this analytic element method paradigm. Uh, there's, there's just a, it, the analytic element method is very simple. So for those of you that in the, in the applied mathematics region, um, this, this will be familiar to you. And uh, it provides kind of the foundation for how it is that we, we solve things with the analytic element method. And I will see if I can, there we go. Uh, I'm gonna to have to make this just a little bit smaller to be able to show it to you. So there's really... Um... Dave, can I just interrupt for a second? It's James here. Um, yeah, sure. There, there is a question in the chat here, but I don't know if you want me to, to see whether or not these should be answered during the talk or left for later, or what do you wanna do here? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't I go for about three more minutes and I'll take questions, okay? All right, sounds good. And, and then I'll show you the code after I've taken whatever questions are out there, okay? All right. So, so anybody that want, that has questions about what it is that I've shown thus far, uh, I would be delighted to take any questions. Um, so, so the paradigm, there, there's really just four steps. Partitioning the domain into elements, that's kind of what I was showing you about those points, lines, uh, polygons, the different types of elements, curved lines, straight lines, whatever, however we depict it. We develop a set of mathematical functions. Um, this is really based of the, upon what I told you that occurred through the 1960s or so. Boundary conditions are prescribed and we solve these boundary conditions by adjusting coefficients. Uh, this too was done through the 1960s or so for individual elements. But then in the analytic element method, we develop comprehensive solutions uh, that, that provide the influence functions for all elements. So we take everything a, a step further than what we've been able to thus far with the mathematics. Uh, so elements, they can take on the geometry of the outside of a circle, inside of a rectangle, uh, an interface across a line. 
Uh, and then we, we bring together the mathematics of the discipline uh, in one of kind of the, the amenable mathematical forms that we have using the Laplacian operator. I'm gonna have to move this screen so I can take you through this a little bit better. Um, uh, Laplace equation, Poisson, Helmholtz, modified Helmholtz, biharmonic heat, and wave equations. So these are kind of the classic uh, formulations that we have. Uh, next, we develop a set of linear, superposi or linear superposition of functions. And I'll show you some examples here. Here's, an, here's a circle element. And we have a coefficient that's multiplied by a, a function. This is a very simple function. It just has a value of zero inside and one outside. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated function. Here it has one on this point, minus one on that point, and kind of the flow goes from plus one to minus one. Here we have something where it has plus one and minus one, so it flows this way. The next, that's multiplied by a coefficient. The next element would go from plus one to minus one to plus one to minus one. And you can think about this, we, you go up to a 20th order uh, uh, a coefficient times a, or a coefficient times a 20th order uh, function, it'll go from plus one to minus one to plus one to minus one 20 times around that circle. So we allow, we, we develop these series of influence functions that allow some variation around an element so we can match our boundary conditions. So this is a, a, a Laplacian type of a flow. We can do that for, wa for waves also. Here is a, a uh, uh, this is a Bessel function. This, this, uh, uh, this is the amplitude. So here waves are moving away from the object. Here waves are moving away from it on this side and away from it on this side. Here waves are moving away from it on this side and away from it on this side. I mentioned a Sommerfeld boundary condition or interface condition, so waves have to go away from the object. They can't go into the object. Um, the next uh, one here would have waves going out, 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 and so forth. So we, we allow a variation of waves going away from an object. Um, another example here is for uh, stress strain. And so here we have compression on this side, tension on the, or I'm sorry, tension on this side, compression on this side. Tension, compression, tension, compression, tension, compression, tension, compression. So we bring together all these elements and ways that, that are all these functions that allow some variation around the outside of the element. And then we say, okay, element, you figure out how to solve for all those coefficients so you can match a boundary condition. You could say, well, um, I know the displacement around this boundary. Well, I know the traction. I know the stress around this boundary. Well, I know that this has to re fully reflect the waves. So whatever your boundary condition is, you, you put together a series of, of equations where you multiply the coefficients times the functions evaluated at a point has to match whatever your boundary condition is. Given groundwater elevation, given temperature, given voltage, whatever it happens to be. We specify a set of control points uh, that allows us to be able to develop a system of equations where we have coefficients times, or I'm sorry, we have a matrix that's evaluated functions times the coefficients to match our boundary condition. Now, this was done back through the 1950s, 1960s in a lot of different fields. There's a lot of different ways you can solve this. Sometimes we can simplify the, co the Fourier coefficients. Uh, sometimes we can use a Chebyshev a formulation to be able to simplify the, the matrix. But, but one way or another, we, we've, we've been able to solve that. What the analytic element method does is it says, okay, well, we know how to do this for one element. Now let's take that one element, the, what, we, what we're trying to solve for that one element and take everything else in the world and call it an additional function. So all the other coefficients for all the other analytic elements uh, are, are in that additional function and the setting. So the regional flow, the, the, the overburden uh, compression that we get from the soils above us, whatever the regional setting is that goes outside of the element. So then the element only solves for the coefficients of itself. And, um, and then we say, okay, well, element, you solve for yourself. Next element, you solve for yourself, given what we know about this element now. Next element, you solve for yourself based upon what we know. And you go around and around and around these elements and solve until finally you converge down to a solution. So that's, that's the basics of the analytic element method. 
And I've talked an awful lot. I talk fast. Uh, James, what can I, what can I re explain or, or answer or what kind of questions are out there? All right, uh, this is a pretty good overview question. It's uh, the question is AM seems to handle a large variety of scenarios. Are there current limitations where AM might not be as useful or practical to implement as numerical methods such as finite volume or finite element? Yep, finite element, finite volume, finite differences, they all have their place. And uh, uh, in, in general, um, if you have a complicated problem, you will be able to solve the problem faster with, without the analytic element. The analytic element has these mathematical functions. And as you add more and more and more mathematical functions, your, your models run slower and slower and slower. So, so that, that's one limitation is just in terms of the, the number, the degrees of freedoms that we can have in an analytic element method solution. Um, if you have a particular problem, and for those of you that are uh, water wave people, uh, this is the wave equation. Uh, the wave equation is different than the mild slope equation. So if you're looking at something where the variability of the bathymetry is smooth, and that's important for your problem, uh, then that is not conducive to an analytic element method solution. Um, there are ways that we can uh, take the solutions that we have and turn them into things that we can solve with the analytic element method. Uh, for example, um, I don't think I have any examples in the book to show this, but in the, in the groundwater world, we assume that the base is constant. And I have a number of papers that analyze looking at stepping base instead of a sloping base. And, and I've shown that if, if, if the steps are small enough, and they don't have to be that small, but if the steps are small enough, you will get the exact same solution that you have with a sloping base model. So sometimes these, these things like uh, of variable conductivity, if, if we have a field of conductivity that, that varies with some kind of a functional form, that may be important. Um, and, and for problems like that, then, then a numerical solution would, uh, would, would, would uh, probably be what you would want to do. Uh, the analytic element method also, however, um, gives you a lot of insight in terms of the things that are important and are not important for your numerical solution. So, so there's a lot of insight that's gathered. Um, and, and I can give you an example there. I, I, I worked with uh, Professor Strock uh, to develop quite a bit of the code for the NAGRAM, for the National Groundwater Model of the Netherlands. Um, and that was all analytic element method. And that gave a lot of insight that was then used to develop a, a um, more detailed layered model with transients of uh, using IMOD for the National Groundwater Model of the Netherlands. Sorry, that was a very long question to a very short, or a very long answer to a very short question. Thanks, Dave. There's another question here regarding the phreatophytes. He's uh, saying, for the tree example, how well do you need to know the characteristics of the subsurface and how is the geometry of the network of tree roots taken into account? Uh, so, somebody, somebody's an eco-hydrologist out there. Uh, so I, I will tell you that, that um, let me see if I can get back to that one quickly. Um, so this particular, when, when, when I put this together, uh, Trevor Ehring and I worked on this one. Um, Trevor is out in groundwater management district number uh, three now in Southwest Kansas. He's their GIS modeler. And, um, I, I didn't know, we, we had no way of knowing what the functional form was of the actual uptake by the tree. We, we knew for that, that, you know, we, we knew where a lot of trees existed for a lot of different types of trees. We know that cottonwood trees put down trees up to about uh, three meters, about 10 feet. Um, we know that they're kind of generally dispersed fairly evenly by the time you get to the water table. Some trees have more pronounced tap roots. Some have spread their, their trees, um, their, their roots out like their branches up above. And so um, in this paper, I developed three different mathematical functions. This one shows the water uptake evenly over the entire uh, canopy of the tree. I also developed a couple of mathematical functions that focused the extraction about the tap root with two different mathematical functions. And so uh, this was something that had never been done before. Uh, these, these mathematical functions were the first 
time that I know of that anybody modeled that update. Um, this here, I can tell you that this particular uh, example, what I, um, actually I only backtraced 10% of the trees. If I would have backtraced all the path lines for all these trees, it would have completely filled this dark. So basically the capture zone for the, this field of phreatophytes is the water, the top of the water column right here. Um, when uh, this was an invited paper, um, and when I got this, I got this, this result on a Friday, the paper was due on Sunday, and I just couldn't believe it. It's like, this can't be right. Um, I don't, you know, how, how do you interpret it? And after thinking about it for a while, well, yes, of course, this has to be right. This has to be the way that, that the, that the particles are going up and down. Uh, it, it just, you know, physically, it makes sense. So once again, a long answer to a short, or a long answer to a short question. Um, these mathematical functions satisfy mass balance. Uh, the mathematical functions satisfy mass balance to the computer accuracy of the computer. So you've got 16 digits of, of accuracy for, for the mass balance. Um, it it's uses the quasi-linear approximation of, of two-dimensional flow to get the three-dimensional streamlines. Um, but that is valid for problems that, that are, de are depute in nature. And so it's, it's, it's a solution. Now, now, how well this matches reality? I think maybe that's what the question was getting at. Um, this will this will give you some insight, so that you can understand what's going on in reality. In reality, there's probably uh, other drivers in the soil column that are that are perhaps um, uh, creating a, a lot of intricacies and, and complexity there as well. Um, one of the things, and uh, I wrote this book so other people can use the analytic element method and develop their solutions, and. Um, you know, one of the things that I have thought about doing, I never have, but you could look at uh, the hydraulic lift of the water being brought up by the tree. So the, the tree pulls hard during the daytime and respires at night and lets the flow go back out into the soil column. So there's kind of a diurnal pattern of, of, of water uh, going in and out of the roots. And so there's a lot of complexity. I don't know that I answered the question. Maybe I danced around it. There was a little bit more subtlety about how do you actually parameterize the trees, I think, but um, I think you got the core well, of it. Yeah, so the water balances, we got that. Um, we, we, th there's lots of papers published on recharge. So we, we at least know what the bounds are of recharge from published articles uh, in this part of Kansas. We, we know that, uh, you know, it ranges between a quarter and a couple inches per year. Uh, depending upon the types of soils you have up above. And um, these, these trees, um, there were some studies that were done uh, using to measure the sap flow to figure out how much water is going up in the plant itself. Um, and uh, there are also some isotope analysis done of that water to be able to differentiate how much of it is coming from the soil and how much of it is coming from deeper in the groundwater. And so we used that information to be able to come up with our estimates of kind of overall how much water is being brought up uh, by uh, the tree from groundwater sources. All right. uh, there is one more question, which you may or may not want to address now, uh, is how do we compare the analytic element method with the boundary element method? Do we have a boundary element person out there? Um, the, are, is there a boundary element person out there? I suspect so, or somebody okay. who knows enough about the boundary element method to be dangerous. So uh, the boundary element uh, field has probably advanced well beyond my understanding of when I've, I've looked at that in the past. Um, the boundary element, um, the primary difference to my knowledge, and I suspect it's probably come a long ways since this, but if you look at some of the early books on boundary element method, um, instead of using a mathematical function to, to model this, um, it would use uh, Gaussian quadrature to do the integration numerically. And there's not a need to do that. The mathematics 
uh, for these double layers and single layers are all out there in the book. Um, the mathematics for these elements all follow Muskelishvili. Um, and actually the, the, which forms a basis for the boundary element as well. And so, I'm, and once again, I'm dancing around the answer, but uh, um, do, do you have any other questions at this point, James? And we can maybe open it up to some more general Q&A at the end too. Yeah, that's the only one for now. Okay, very good. Um, based upon my response, if, if, if you'd like to continue this conversation, I'd be delighted to do that uh, shortly. Um, the last thing I wanted to do, so I wanted to kind of introduce you to the kind of things that we can do with analytic element method, the kind of problems that we can address, the simplicity of the formulation, the complexity gets in the formulation of the mathematics, but once you do that, it's done. Um, uh, and, and, and then it becomes kind of an elegant solution of bringing things together. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you, and I showed you the book, I showed you the kind of things that are in the book. The last thing I wanted to show you was some examples. And um, I'm gonna go to um, scilab.org. And um, Scilab is a, uh, essentially an open source MATLAB. Um, I used to teach all my courses using MATLAB and I did, I, I wrote code with, with students using MATLAB. Um, uh, about a dozen years ago, a, a colleague from France, Philippe Legrand came and visited me for a couple of weeks. And uh, he said, hey, Dave, you should really look at uh, Scilab. Uh, INRAE in, in France has developed this new tool and you may be able to use it in your course. And so I, I, I looked at it and it's really a nice software um, uh, tool to be able to, to analyze uh, engineering and mathematical problems. And you can download it right here. It's open source, it's free. Um, I like it because once I've taken students through a set of exercises and we write code together, they can use that code forever. Once they leave the classroom, the code that they write, wrote in classrooms, however long ago what it was, still will run on Scilab. And um, I have a set of examples. Uh, this is the zip file that's out there. And let me just show you um, this one right here. So this is just some Scilab code. If you download Scilab, you'll be able to run all of these examples that I have out there. And so you can see that the interface looks very similar to, to MATLAB. Uh, let me just run this one so you can see it. And so this is the example that I showed you of the three wells uh, with the streamlines and um, the particular mathematics for this is simple. Uh, this is all the code right here, Q over two pi log Z minus the location of the well. So it's the complex version of the, of the uh, team solution. Uh, there's three wells, so there's three team solutions. Um, let me show you one more example and then I'll take you a little bit more into kind of how the code is organized. So I'll take you to a little bit more complicated example. And um, let me go down here to uh, this one here. And I'm just running this on a laptop. So I'll start the running and then I'll take you through the code as it's running. This one takes about a minute to run. Uh, at, at the top is kind of the boilerplate. This is all um, op open source. I've, I've got the Creative Commons uh, uh, attribute up at the top of every one of these. Um, this particular one has uh, it call every one of them calls uh, this visualized code. All that does is makes the pretty pictures, the greens and the drawing the lines and so forth, doing the contours. So it's, it makes the pretty pictures. Uh, this particular type of problem, the boundary condition is a potential specified. There's a uniform flow component uh, where we can specify the known elevation of of 
or the known potentials at a set of points. Um, we have an, a complex potential for that, a vector field for that. We've got a solve algorithm to solve for the coefficients, and then a algorithm here to, to compute the error, the residual error. I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, the second type of element is a slit element. Uh, so this is, um, the, here you can specify the endpoints, uh, the type of solution we're specifying a given potential, um, the value of the potential that we're trying to solve for. Uh, it sets up the different things that are required in the list structure for that slit. Uh, this is um, omega. This is just nothing more than coefficient times z to the minus n power in a transformed domain. Uh, so this, this is the function that's straight out of the book. Uh, this is the complex vector field. And so um, this equation comes straight out of the book, coefficient times a function. Um, there's, these are the additional functions that I was talking about in, in chapter two. Uh, this is the solve algorithm. So this solves for the coefficients using that A matrix and um, the given uh, potential that we have right here. So that's our F function, that's our A. This is our coefficient. Uh, we compute the error at the end. So the residual error is nothing more than the computed uh, potential minus the specified, let me get out of here for a second, minus the specified potential. Uh, then we take it across all the elements and develop a root mean squared error or an absolute error and, 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 and show the results there. Uh, and then it can draw. Uh, here we specify the endpoints. We specify the uniform flow. We specify the set. This is all out there, so you can take a look at it later. Specify the, the nodes. Specify how the slits are connected. Um, we iterate through a number of times till we get a small solution. We show the error, and then we compute the potential of the vector field and, and draw it. Um, this is the result that we get. Uh, so here's our, our uh, stream network uh, with increase in stream, uh, increase in potential along each of the stream reaches. Um, it iterates through all the elements solved for themselves. It took 524 times of solving everybody for themselves to get a residual error where the change in potential across all control points of all elements was let, we had uh, 10, 10 to the minus 12 uh, uh, accuracy. Um, here's the root mean square error for every element. The root mean square error is 10 to the minus five for everything. Um, we have a, a difference in head of a, a potential of about 10. So our, our normalized root mean square error gives us about six, six significant digits uh, of, of accuracy. And there's a number of other solutions out there. You can go ahead and take a look at, you know, they're, they're all there. They're, Organize the same way you specify the element. You have the computation of the of the complex potential or the potential and the and the vector field. Um, you solve for it. You draw it, and and so it's all organized around the same basic architecture. And that's as far as I wanted to, as I thought I'd be able to get you today, uh, James. Thanks everybody for your attention, and I'd, I'd be delighted to take any other questions or have discussion as as uh, as as you see a fit all right uh so i guess we'll open it up to uh questions uh general questions specific questions um feel free to throw them in the question and answer box As, as you're thinking, I'll, I'll just kind of take a step back and say that this is something that I've been working on for a long time. I've, I've been studying the analytic element method for a little over 30 years. And, um, and I, I also uh, should have apologized up front. I, I come from Minnesota. Originally, I'm at North Dakota now, but I come from Minnesota. Actually, North Dakotans talk about the same as Minnesotans too, but uh, we, we talk fast. We have to talk fast to get our words out before before they freeze. So apologize if I'm talking too fast for you. No worries. Uh, I don't see any other questions here. Um, so given that, I think we'll probably uh, close up. We got four minutes left in the hour, so that's appropriate. 
Uh, thank you very much, David, for your presentation today. Really enjoyed it. It's uh, really neat to see some of the stuff uh, you're doing with the, uh, the extension of the analytic element method to waves and, and some other fields that we have not uh, been working in before. So really great stuff. Um, and we have uh, some thanks in the Q&A area as well. So uh, thank you, David, for your presentation. Thank you. And, and I would just encourage you to also that um, the, I, I wrote the book to try to make it simple. And, um, you know, I would just encourage you if, if you have some interest in this to, to at least take a look at the part that's out there for free and, and see whether it's something that you might be able to utilize. And, and I, I'm really hoping that we can develop a, a broader uh, understanding of the kind of things we can do with AEM techniques in the, in the, in, in the, science and engineering discipline. So, so thank you very much uh, for, for the opportunity to be able to present to this group. Thank you. And I think we'll uh, probably close down here. Dave, we should catch up uh, 